There I go. Hey, everybody. Uh, Tina Campbell, the New York Regional Partner of Master Networks. Welcome. Um, we are so excited to have you. This is um, Master Networks uh, Regional Quarterly Workshop. We haven't had one in a little while because the last one we had was February and then the uh, situation with COVID happened. So we're going to get back to that. We're doing our quarterly. Um, what we love about this is that we are a national networking organization, but we are about learning. Uh, we're learning based and we're community minded. And what I love about this is that this is for our members by our members. So the three speakers that you're going to hear are top notch and they're all members, which makes me so proud to be uh, to be part of this. So I don't want to make, uh, you know, without further ado, I want to uh, get this going. So today we are here to learn how to think like an entrepreneur. Uh, we have three, as I mentioned, three of our speakers. Um, each one will take about 20 minutes to speak on their topic. Uh, and then we're going to, as I said, feel free to ask questions in the chat and we'll ask them at the end of the three speakers. Um, let's see what else. Um, you set your screen to speaker view if you would like, so you only see the speaker. And I'm going to go move along quick and I'm going to introduce our first speaker. And that is a good friend of ours and member and area director for Master Networks, Rick Gabrielli. He's going to be speaking on the currency of connection. He'll explain all that. He is currently the COO and visionary of Scarsdale Denta and Spa Wellness, along with his wife, Carol. They're distributors for Beamer and co-author of the currency of connection, which is coming out today. So he's going to ask you if you want to, to connect with him on his website. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I'm going to turn it over to you, Rick and put you and let's see, where'd you go? There you are. And I am going to unmute you or can you unmute yourself? Can and you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, go ahead. All right, cool. Well, welcome everybody today. I'm really excited to be opening this up and uh, couldn't be happier. Welcome to the Currency of Connection. Uh, as Tina mentioned, I'm Rick Gabrielli. I'm an area director here in the New York region for Master Networks. And, uh, you know, I have to start with a special thanks to Tina Campbell, Lynn Rowe, Jim Sandler, and the entire Master Networks family for this incredible opportunity to serve and educate. Our most popular tool is service with gratitude. And I'm super grateful to have the chance to share with you today. So before I start, I want to just say, I want to tell you a little story about the currency of connection. Um, when I was a little league coach, when my kids were small, um, I was a very loving guy and it wasn't really all that accepted in the sports world to kind of come out with this very loving nature. So when the kids were about nine years old, I was coaching against this guy. He was kind of like this dark figure, right? And so he was like all about winning and I was all about, you know, having a good time and helping the kids and, and learning and, and this supportive culture. So all of a sudden, at the end of one year, the two of us are like battling it out, right, for, you know, the championship. And so somehow we got together and we kind of, you know, we played the national anthem before the game. We really had almost this respected connection that happened. And I, I think of that as a great example of the currency of connection. So long story short, me and this guy went at it. We ended up becoming great friends after that. Um, he saw the, my way, I saw his way. That is about, I think that's about 12 years ago now. We're best friends. Our families are best friends. We talk about that all the time. It was one of the best times in our lives, but it's a good example of the energy that could happen between people when you let the currency of connection happen. So even from two different worlds, you go at it with this unity and magic happens. So what is the currency of connection? It's a magical tree that provides its own light, air, and water. When it's at work, it draws you in. It's magnetic. It's attractive. It's nourishing. We can actually live off the food from this tree it becomes fuel that makes more fuel. It's the dream of all inventors. 
It's our own personal perpetual motion machine. And it's a vital piece of your success plan as an entrepreneur. If you unlock this tool and make it a permanent part of your mindset, there's no limit to your trajectory. So what is currency? Currency can have several meanings. Most people, when they hear the word currency, they think about money, right? They think about the value of some object or something that you trade. Most of the time, currency is some form of exchange, and that's certainly true. But what I think of when I think of currency is there's a physical currency. There's an emotional currency, a spiritual, a mental currency. There's social currency, and there's metaphysical currency, and of course, there's financial financial currency. For me, currency is energy, and it's something that we can exchange. It's never created or destroyed. It's always there. So I'm going to start by talking about physical currency. That's what we see, what we feel, what we touch with our hands. Physical currency is the tangible value of things. So let's say I give you a piece of jewelry to hold. It's got this currency to it. And so that's the physical, that you see it as valuable. But there's also an unseen value to that jewelry, and that's the emotional currency. So that piece of jewelry may have some special meaning to me. It could be an estate item or something from a loved one who passed. It's got this emotional element to it. And it brings a value, a different value, in addition to the physical value. It could be something that has high value to you. So that's emotional currency. And then there's a spiritual currency. We feel good inside. We feel connected to something or someone. And there's a difference between just seeing an object and having a feeling when you meet someone. So there's the spiritual energy that's created, this spiritual currency, which could give us a very high spark and a high vibration. And then there's the mental currency. We're thinking about this exchange and there's a constant give and take. We're exchanging feelings, items, and core values. That social currency, that's a feeling of connection with others. Many of you, here today are in our Master Networks family, and you come here for social currency. That's that connection between people. And then there's metaphysical currency. Metaphysical currency is so important because that's the energy that can duplicate itself and create more of itself from the connection. It's that perpetual motion machine we talked about earlier. And it just keeps on creating as we make more connections. So what is connection? Usually our first connection is to some parent or guardian that's there for us in the beginning. And then it could be connection to an environment. As humans, we're hardwired for that. It should be a natural instinct, but very often the connection is not whole or it's not what we want. We'd like it to be more nourishing in some way or, or even supportive. And even as an infant and a very young child, we're always putting out energy and currency that supports connection or lack of connection, and that's part of our journey. In Dr. David Hawkins' classic, the book Power Versus Force, he states we actually calibrate and put out our vibration at birth. So what's interesting is when we look back over our lives, we see periods of connection and sometimes, unfortunately, separation and division when you realize that connection is something so important and that you can actually influence connection by reaching out and being open to meeting people, it's purely magical. Building our connections is so critical and it's such a telling piece of our story and our fabric. As we grow up and we're influenced by our families, our communities, sometimes school teachers, classmates, educational experiences, potential work experiences, and then even relationships. Let's say we find a significant other, we build a life with somebody like that. All these different connections are always happening to us. We're almost like computers taking in data. And each one of these connections we're giving value to, 
and or using to rate future connections and opportunities. In my own life, I've been blessed enough to have a lot of great examples of connection. Sometimes people connecting with me, I'll just use the example of coaches and teachers, before I even knew what it was and, and that I didn't even appreciate fully what they were trying to do. But now as an adult and a coach myself and a teacher, I realize how many children we're reaching out to, but sometimes we can't even get through to them. So in our own lives, there are always people reaching out to us and trying to connect with us. The question is today, are we ready for those connections and what can we do with them? So if you're on this call today, you're probably interested in finding out how to build deeper connections and finding new ways to use the currency of connection to better your own life and the lives of others. So let's just use the example of a loved one, a spouse, a husband or wife, your favorite person, or even a business prospect. Instead of thinking about connection as what it is to you, imagine putting yourself in the thoughts and feelings of the other person when you connect and learn what connection is to them. Start to look at connection from now on as what it is in the other person's mind and heart. What are they looking for from a connection? The best message here for me and what I've learned is connection is what it is in the other person's eyes. So if you're trying to connect, think about somebody else and what they want from your connection. And when we talk about connection, there's always some work involved. First, because you have to reach out to somebody, you have to put your hand out, you have to pick up a phone, you have to send a text, you have to email them, you have to show up out in the world. I always tell friends and clients when I'm on calls with them, take a look around you in the room you're in right now. You can do it right now. Do you see anybody? If not, you have to go out into the world and meet somebody. That's the work. That's the hard part. That's the piece we often shy away from. The work involved is to get out, meet people, put your hand out, open your arms, open your mind, open your eyes and heart to the possibilities of connecting with another person. And then you can let nature and instinct and metaphysics take over. The energy between two people, that's the magic. We know that if we look at this from a physics standpoint, our energy actually extends outward from our bodies, in some cases 10, 20, even 30 feet. So we're in the, when we're in the presence of other people, even that far apart, we can start to feel these subtle energies. And if we tune into that, we can actually feel the connection between two people. Nikola Tesla said in his work, if you wanna find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. So now at this time in history, we see the whole world coming together on so many different levels for connection. There are different countries and different races and genders, preferences, and people who think differently. Every day can be a gift if we just reach out to somebody else and do that little bit of work. I know in my own life, when I think about the work that was involved in connecting, it was only really 1% work and 99% magic. All I had to do was reach out my hand, send an email or text someone, Hey, John, would you like to talk over coffee? Simply connect and then find out about the other person. That's where the magic happens. I start with the heart. If I open my heart when I go out into the world each day and I, and I just say, this is going to be my energy source. This is going to be the piece of me that I show to the world. Much like a retail store, your personal store of connection is open. When you open your heart, it's like opening the front doors and inviting people in. They browse, and if they see something they want, they may buy it. Everyone is not going to buy, but at least they're all going to know what you have, your special brand of connection. And then you'll find through the magic of alignment, some will gravitate to you. One of your greatest gifts will be when you see somebody else connect and light up, when they find their purpose. The best part is seeing them share it with others. So I have a really great story I want to tell about a Master Networks member who, when I first introduced her to Master Networks, 
I told her about uh, what we do and, and she, was, she said, not now. So about a month later, I asked her, hey, what about you know checking us out? And she said, not now. So another month went by, I asked her again, not now. Okay, I'll come to one meeting. So she came to one meeting, she waited some more, then she joined after about four months. Now she's crushing it. She's connecting. She's lighting up others. She's doing face-to-faces. She's having in-person meetings. She's even being asked to go and do interviews. And she's sharing her expertise and her education with everything, everybody. I hear great testimonials about her in meetings when she's not there. So just another wonderful example of the currency of connection and the energy that's created from this amazing gift. So why is the currency of connection so critical to the entrepreneurial mindset? Well, for one reason, you can become a connector versus a collector. A connector is a giver. It's somebody who always gives. And a collector is someone who just collects business cards or leads, and it's that type of connection. So why would you want to be a connector? Because you want to be seen as someone who gives first. So much more will come when you use this style. It also teaches you active listening. And there's a physical aspect to active listening. Many of you, when you hear the term active listening, you think about, well, listening with the intent to understand versus respond. Now, I have a great story about one year. I know you're never going to believe this, but I lost my voice. I couldn't say a word. So I was actually reading a magazine and I saw an ad in there for a voice coach. Her name is Ronnie Lederman. I went to see her and I thought I was gonna get voice lessons and she was gonna teach me how to use my voice better so that I could speak again. But what she really started to talk to me about was my listening. And she asked me how often I listen and how well I listen. But she also taught me about the architecture of our bodies. And she said that, Rick, when you're listening with the intent to respond, your tongue is actually loaded. So physically, when your tongue is forward in your mouth, it actually closes off your ears. So the architecture of our bodies is so that when it is created, so when we're trying to speak, we actually can't hear as much. We may not be talking yet, but we're loaded and ready to talk. That's, that's listening with the intent to respond. And then she went on to tell me that when you're listening with the intent to fully understand and hear, you have a relaxed architecture, and then the tongue settles back in the throat, actually opens the ears, and it actually opens the eyes more, so you can take in more information and more data. So it's really being present, and it was just magical. It was one of the turning points of my professional life and personal life. Why else would you like to do this? You'll master power versus force. I mentioned earlier, Dr. David Hawkins in his book, Power Versus Force, talks about calibrating for connection and how our connection raises our vibration. And the main idea here is to use your power and power is still, power comes from meaning and it gives life and supports and it supports limitless thinking and limitless opportunity. And force is actually, if you think physics, it moves against something. So it's actually limited and it's always in opposition. So coming from your true power is connecting and attractive and force is consuming and polarizing. So why should we let go of the old mindset and why it's vital? Well, if you let go of your old mindset, you get new programming. You may have some bad programming to overcome. I know I did. You get to think new ideas and you need new people to share with you. One thing I learned through this connection is I'm getting so much more information than I'm giving. I'm one person giving out information and I'm, I have hundreds of people giving me new information and new ideas. So what's happening to my mindset? It's going from a probability mindset, which is ignoring and getting stuck in too much thinking and not enough action, And it's moving to a possibility mindset, which is more exploring and asking, how can I make a difference? And it's limitless thinking. So is 2020 a total loss for you or a total shift? You get to decide. You get to figure out 
how 2020 happened for you versus to you. So I'm going to give you some advice about using your work, love, and the courage to keep going. When we build through connection, we can do anything. Don't go it alone. I know for years I was a solopreneur and I took it seriously. I wanted to do everything by myself. Many of you on this call today can probably relate. Sometimes it just happens automatically because we're sitting in an office or a home, certainly over the past six months, but you don't need to do it alone. We're here together to support each other. So how do you choose connection over fear? What news channel are you watching? Are you watching your news on TV and the internet and Facebook? Or are you getting your news from Master Netflix? That's the channel I watch every day. I jump on a meeting and I've got this room full of nourishing, uplifting people who are all experts in their field, ready to share with me and teach me. So think about where are you getting your information? Make sure you have daily positive input. Get a coach. Get an account accountability partner or partners. Engage in some form of self-development every day. I do. Please choose people over screens, unless you're seeing them on a Zoom screen. Don't spend a lot of time just looking at a phone and looking at posts and, and, and watching what other people are doing. Be the one who does something. Connect with people. Why do you need to spread hope? I don't know if any of you have read the book, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. It's a classic. It's one of my favorite books. We all need something to live for. He actually quotes Nietzsche in that book and says, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. We connect to find meaning, our purpose, and our why. And through others, we find ourselves. I hope you'll explore this topic more by reaching out and connecting with me. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Rick. Really appreciate it. That's that's wonderful. So, put your uh, questions for Rick in the uh, chat, please, and we'll get to them after. Right now, we're going to switch over now to Lynn Rowe. Lynn, I'm going to unmute you, and I'm going to just share my screen quickly in order to just give you a little bit of a, a bio for um, Berlin. And just let me get this larger so you can see. So I'd like to introduce uh, Lynn Rowe. Or Lynn, you're, you're, uh, you're unmuted, right? Um, I am, yes. And I just want to say, you know, um, when, we, when we all talked uh, about who we could have speak, uh, not only did we know, oh, sorry, can you, Mute yourselves if you are unmuted. Um, so anyway, we were thinking we were like, you know what? We were all said Lynn Rowe because that's you know we knew as we heard we hear about her um, as we do our daily uh, testimonials. She so often is um, sorry. She so often is uh, brought up as one of the major business uh, coaches in Master Networks. So. Uh, she is a certified professional coach, group facilitator, and change maker. Lynn helps independent businesses develop a foundation of leadership that serves as a catalyst for growth. So I'll leave it at that. I'm also going to put Lynn's um, free course offer in the chat so you don't have to write all this down and her information. So uh, Liz, um, Lynn, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to move it to you. Um, I'm sorry, Joyce, I just have to mute you. Uh, Lynn, uh, you ready? Can you hear me all? There you go. Okay. So why are some entrepreneurs successful while others just slowly fade away? Or even when they're in the same business, they might be doing the same thing and some succeed and some don't. And why do about half of the businesses get started closed down within about two years? As a business coach, I've become very close to the owners of many businesses, so I know how these leaders think. And I believe that success for the business comes down to the leader of the business. And I think there are six specific ways of thinking that, um, that really make the difference, and it's their mindset. So first I wanna ask you, which person do you believe would be more successful? 
pessimist or an optimist? Most of you would say the optimist, right? So let's say they both start something new and it doesn't work. The pessimist looks at that attempt and says, you know, see, it didn't work. I guess, I guess I'm done. The optimist says, well, I haven't found the solution yet. And they try something else. They continue to try. And what happens is that the optimist actually has more successes than the pessimist because they kept trying. They probably also have a whole lot more failures uh, because they kept trying, but they have many more successes. And that is the difference that makes a big difference. So I want, I want to think just for a few minutes about brainstorming when you've got something new that you're thinking about trying. Uh, brainstorming is a great tool to work with. And um, there's some things though that you need to know about brainstorming a solution to an issue, right? As soon as you say something like, oh, that won't work, or, oh, we can't do that because blah, 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 whatever it is, your brain actually stops looking for solutions. It stops working on that problem. It shuts down. So if you then change the question, though, and say, hmm, I wonder how we could make that work, or I wonder what I could do differently that would make a difference. Now your brain is starting to think about, okay, what other possibilities are there? I love this quote by David Severance. It's, leaders choose to live in the space of possibility and opportunity, not from limitation and challenge. I'll read that again. Leaders choose to live in the space of possibility and opportunity, not from limitation and challenge. And I really believe this is true for successful leaders in business. They look at the possibilities. They look at the opportunities. They don't look at the things that, they don't look at things and say, oh, that's not going to work or that's not a good idea. They, they, they turn it around and say, how can we make it work? The other thing is that successful entrepreneurs, they believe in themselves and they believe in the product or service that they provide. So, Number one of six, successful entrepreneurs have a positive mental attitude towards what they're doing. Next one. So how many of you are married or in a committed relationship? Just raise your hand, let me see. Yeah, it's a lot of you, probably most of you. So at some point in your relationship, did you say to your significant other, I think this is pretty good, but I'm not going to commit until I know everything will work out the way I want it to. Right? Nobody says that. So why do entrepreneurs do that in their business? I think this, uh, this business idea is pretty good, but I'm not going to commit myself to it until I know it's going to work. You can't build a business and be successful that way. Successful entrepreneurs are all in. They are totally committed. No matter what, this is going to work and they make it work. They're also solid in what they're doing. They know what they're doing. They know why they're doing it. They know what's in it for them. They know what's in it for their clients. And they also know what's the bigger contribution that they're making to the world or their community. What's the bigger impact of their work? So they have that to fall back on. It's a, it, it helps to propel them forward. So that's number two. Successful entrepreneurs are committed to succeeding in their business. And they know where they're going and they know why they're going there. So the next one. Now we all know of people who are thinking about how they might want to start something next week or next month, right? You know what I mean. They're, they're thinking they're maybe going to do something. Well, that's not how successful entrepreneurs operate. Successful entrepreneurs, they take action with urgency. They do things, they make decisions, and they make it happen. Yes, they're fear fearful. Yes, things might not work out. They feel that fear and they move on anyway. And they actually use that fear sometimes to propel them forward. It gives them energy. Fear can be a source of energy if you're not too frightened. It can be a source of energy. I'm a little scared, I'm a little nervous, but I'm going to do this, right? 
So they use that fear to help them. Um, and they're willing to take a chance and try something new. So that's the, the free course that Tina mentioned. Um, it's, it's in the chat. It's a course that um, I'm offering called Courage, Risks and Rewards, Taking a Chance to Change Your Business. It's a self-study course and you guys can just download it if you're interested. Successful entrepreneurs also make decisions quickly. So I wanna tell you a little story about Ken. Ken was an engineer who had a family business and the family business was kind of small, had about eight employees when he took over. And he grew that business into a very large international business with offices around the world. And when I asked him about his successes and the decisions he had to make to grow, he said that he only made about 52% of his decisions correctly. That means mo almost half of his decisions were wrong. But the difference is that he was continually making decisions. He wasn't waiting for things to happen. And if you talk to other successful entrepreneurs, you will find that they all will tell you they made lots and lots of mistakes, but they kept making decisions and making things happen and they acted with urgency. So that's number three, successful entrepreneurs take action with urgency and they make decisions quickly. So on to the next one. I'm an outdoors person throughout my life. I've been on many canoe trips. I do lots of things outdoors, but I've been on many canoe trips. And when you go out into the wilderness, let's say you're maybe seven days, five to seven days paddling from the nearest logging camp. You are truly on your own, right? You're carrying all your supplies with you. So you've got a limited amount of food, limited amount of everything. Um, and while you're on these trips, you're going to run across rivers that are rough. You know, sometimes you have really rough white water and you have got to paddle super hard, like really paddle hard in order not to hit the rocks or not to get into a big wave that's going to capsize you. And you're paddling and paddling and paddling. Sometimes you come to a waterfall and there's no way to paddle through the waterfall. You have to get out of your canoe. You have to haul all your gear around the waterfall. Then you have to go back and get your canoe and haul that around the waterfall. And then you can get back in your canoe and keep going. It's hard work. I can tell you it's really hard work if there are black flies out there. It is no fun. <laughs> Sometimes you're on a calm lake. So you're going along in the, on the lake. And it's, oh, it's so nice to relax and the sun is shining. But the thing is you have to keep paddling. Because if you don't, you're just gonna sit in the middle of that lake and eventually run out of food. You have to keep paddling. So no matter where you are and what you're doing, you have to keep going. Yes, you can rest a bit, but you do have to keep going. The other thing is that when you're on a journey like this, you are frequently checking the map to make sure that you're headed towards civilization and that hot shower you've really been missing. <laughs> This is a great metaphor for being a business owner. Sometimes things are rough. You know, you've got to work damn hard to keep, it, keep your business going in the direction you want it to go. Sometimes you can't do what you thought you were going to do and you have to find a way around it. Sometimes you can rest a little bit, but you have to continue to paddle. You have to continue moving forward. You really, if you want your business to make it through anything, you have to keep moving it forward. So the first part of this one is keep moving forward and focus on your goal. The second one is, the second part of this is you have to be willing to work for it and work hard. And the third thing is that successful entrepreneurs, they regularly evaluate where they are, how they're doing on their direction towards their, uh, their goal, whatever their goal is. And by regularly, I mean, often it's daily, but it's, it's usually at least weekly. They sit down, they review what went well this week. What changes could I have made to, to do something better? So number four, 
successful entrepreneurs are tenacious. They keep moving forward at all times and they're focused on their goals. So John Maxwell says, if you want to grow, you need to be intentional about how you grow. I can tell you that the successful entrepreneurs that I know, they're all consistent learners. They invest in who they want to become. And they see themselves as the key employee. And then they figure out what that key employee needs to learn next to get to where they want their business to be. So they're willing to invest time and money in themselves. And they can do that in lots of different ways. They could take a course. They could connect with an expert in the area they want to learn. They might set aside specific time for self-study. They might read everything they can find on a certain topic. They might research to find the best way for them to learn the skills. But the point is they all focus on what it is they need to learn. So number five. Successful entrepreneurs are willing to invest in themselves and they're intentional about how they grow. Steve Jobs, you know, he was known as not a really nice guy. He was a bit of a loner. He was kind of mean and nasty a lot of the time. And yet he didn't build his business alone. And this is something that Rick just alluded to. Steve Jobs built a team and, this, and all entrepreneurs can take a lesson from that. They may, many people feel that they have to do it all on their own because it's their business, but no one actually succeeds on their own. Successful entrepreneurs always look for allies, for people who can help them. Um, and then the second part of that is that they are willing to listen and consider other people's ideas before they make a decision. So often it happens that you're in a meeting and there will be lots of suggestions put forward, but the person making the decision actually isn't listening to what the suggestions are. So they don't give them fair consideration. You don't always have to choose what other people suggest for you, but you should always give them fair consideration. So that's, um, so that's the important thing in that. And the last part of this is that once you bring other people into you, your life, your business, to help you get to where you wanna be, you also now have accountability built into your life. As soon as you tell someone, I need your advice on this, I'm not sure quite how to handle it, now you are accountable to actually make a decision and do something. As soon as you, ask someone to do something for you. Now you're accountable to do whatever your portion of that job was. So number six is that leaders collaborate. So those are the six not mindsets that I believe entrepreneurs make entrepreneurs successful. Successful entrepreneurs have a positive mental attitude. They are totally committed and self-motivated. They take action with urgency, and I've got to tell you, that's probably the most important one of all. They have perseverance and tenacity. They keep working at it. They invest in themselves, and they collaborate with others. So Tina's going to put in the chat a summary of those six mindsets, so you don't have to actually have written them all down or remembered them. And I thank you all very much. Great. Thank you, Lynn. Yes, I put that in the chat. It's a PDF for those. You go into the chat and you can download it. Thank you so much. Right now, I'm going to, thank you, Lynn. I'm going to unmute Jim Sandler, and I'm going to, if you could mute yourself, Lynn, uh, that would be great. And then I'll take us over to share this PowerPoint again, just to give some information. So Jim, you, um, you're unmuted. Hi, everybody. All right, there you are. Okay, so let me, um, let me share my screen and get back to that PowerPoint so I can. Does everybody see that? Give me the, give me the thumbs up. Great, thank you. 
Um, so we're going to move on to our last speaker, and that is Jim Sandler. Um, he's going to talk about the seven critical mistakes that uh, business people make. And he has over 30 years of building and leading domestic and international companies in a variety of industries. He specializes in helping businesses navigate all of their business challenges that stand in their way of growth and profitability. I want to mention that uh, Jim has been um, with me on this Master Networks journey. He is the regional trainer and area director for us at the uh, at the uh, regional level. And I just want to say thank you. He's been uh, uh, absolutely crucial to uh, creating this learning based. Uh, um, mindset that we have in Master Network. So I'll stop sharing and I'll give you over to Jim. Thank you very much, uh, Tina. And great, I just want to say great job, Rick and Lynn. Super, it's going to be a tough act to follow. So I wanted to speak today about the seven critical mistakes that business owners make, and we don't, they don't have to make them. And the first one comes from Michael Gerber, and it's all about the e-myth. And if you haven't checked it out, you should. And basically what it says is that just because you're good at some skill or trade, you're automatically qualified to run a business that does that skill or trade. And that is so false. Because uh, let me give you an example or a quick story. I had a client that was a plumber and he was working for Roto-Rooter and, and uh, he was looking at what he was making compared to what Roto-Rooter was charging. And he said, wow, I could make four times the money if I just open up my own plumbing business. And the last thing I told him before we stopped working together was call Roto-Rooter back and try and get your old job back. Because the reality is that what you end up doing is you end up spending between 25 and 33% of the time working on this product or service that the business represents and 67 to 75% of the time is spent working on the business end of the business. And in fact, that's a big problem because, because if, if you're spending two thirds to 75% of the time working on the business instead of working on just the product or service, then you are actually missing the point and you're setting yourself up for failure. The number two point is not having a vision for your business, for yourself, and not having a formal plan. If you don't know where you're going, how are you gonna get there? It's like, putting a, it's like putting a plan together or putting a schedule together to go and not be on vacation. And what you end up doing is instead of making a reservation and instead of deciding where you want to go, you just hop in the car and wherever you end up, that's where you end up going. And if you do that for the business, you're going to end up failing. You have to have a look as to what you want to have in the future and where you see the business going in order to make sure you get there. Otherwise, you're going nowhere. The third one is a lack of financial management. One of the scariest things that I find is when I ask business owners during our first conversation, what does it cost you to turn on your lights and open up your doors to have your business? And the scary part is almost all of them can't tell me. Think about that for a second. If you have no idea what it costs to open up your business and operate your business, how can it possibly be successful? It can't. How do you price your products? If you don't know what your overhead costs are, if you don't know what it costs to run your business, how can you price your products or services? What a lot of companies do is they basically say, well, my competition's doing it this way, so I have to do it, I have to price it this way. And what ends up happening is a lot of times you're either losing money or you're throwing away money. I had a client who was an electrician and we were taking a look as to why he wasn't making the money that he thought he was, uh, was trying to make. He was charging $70 an hour 
to do electrical work. But when we put the numbers together, it was costing him almost $100 an hour just to operate his business. How can, how can you operate a business like that? We ended up moving it so that he could charge $125 an hour. He was actually making a profit and he got more clients. The fear of raising prices should not be a problem. We deal with different kinds. We deal with value-based businesses and commodity-based businesses. Now, if you're a commodity-based business and everybody else is doing what you do, then it is subject to price. But if you're not, and you can do, sell your products and services based upon your value proposition, you can be more profitable. People will see you as a better investment and you have the opportunity to make more money and get higher level clients. The third is failure to see delegate, excuse me, the fourth, failure to see delegation as a critical element of successful leadership. There is a very interesting article. It was one of the, the largest uh, read articles in the history of Harvard Business Review, and it's called Who's Got the Monkey? I actually did a presentation down at, at Connect last year on this exact topic. And it's all about delegation. And who's got the monkey is all about a, a manager who was tired of the fact that all of the people that were underneath him were bringing in their problems to him. And he, wasn't, he was overwhelmed. And after bringing all the problems to him on a Saturday, he was in the office trying to resolve the problems. And he looked out his window and he saw that all the people that brought their problems to him were out there playing golf and he was stuck doing all the work. It doesn't have to be that way. And the biggest reason that people believe that they can't delegate is because nobody is going to care about their business the way they do. But what ends up happening is you become like a juggler and you try and do everything on your own. And when it gets to be too many balls in the air, they start dropping. You can't do it all. I mean, think about it. How many of you live in houses and you do your own lawns and you do your own uh, roofing and you do all of your own repairs? Most people don't. They get ec experts to do it for them. They get people that know better how to do it than they do. And by doing that, you can spend the time working on the things that you're good at, the things that will bring in more business. But you have to be willing to delegate in order to do that. One of the things that prevents people from delegating or business owners from delegating is the fear that other people will make mistakes. And John Wooden, who was a philosophy professor at UCLA and was also the most successful college basketball coach in the history of college basketball. And one of his famous lines was, the team that makes the most mistakes wins. Think about that for a second. The team that makes the most mistakes wins. If you don't make any mistakes, you're not trying to get out of your comfort zone. You stay within your comfort zone and you're doing the same things over and over and over and over again. It's important that we move and we encourage both ourselves and our employees, take chances. Get out of your comfort zone. By making those mistakes, you'll get out of your comfort zone and you will learn to do things better. The fifth, putting up with mediocrity. The way we hire people is all wrong. The way we keep people is all wrong. As entrepreneurs, we end up hiring out of need we end up hiring because somebody just left and now I need someone right away. 
So we end up hiring the first body that comes in that looks like they may be possibly okay. Or we end up keeping people who we shouldn't keep. I had a client in uh, Rockland County who was uh, the president of a market research company. They were doing pretty big, big time market research work for Pepsi-Cola and some of the others. And what ended up happening was he said to me during a coaching session that, you know, there's one person, we promoted this person to vice president. And as soon as we did that, they became like Attila the Hun. And I really have to do something about it. And I said, okay, what are you going to do about it? Well, I don't know. I don't have anybody to take their place. What am I going to do if I get rid of her right away? There's no reason for that. What you end up doing is you put up with mediocrity. Now, there's a really good um, a movement, and it's actually a book as well, called Top Grading. And basically what that says is, we want, as employees, we want to work with A players. We don't want to work with B players or C players and heaven forbid, D players. We want to work with people who are going to make us better. I mean, think about people who are playing sports. If you all play recreational sports, do you want to play with someone who is so inferior to you just to make your ego better? Once or twice may be great, but it's not going to make you any better. We like to pay, play with people who are at our equal or maybe even a little bit better than us because it makes us better. It raises our level. One of the things I've been saying in Master Networks meetings this past week and previously, take a look at the five people you spend your most time with, both personally and professionally. They represent who you are. If you're spending time with them, they represent who you are. Are they people that rise you up? Or are they part of that mediocrity? What we want to do as business owners is we want to surround ourselves with people that are at least as good as us, if not better. It's better if we can provide ourselves and surround ourselves with people who are better than we are. That's what makes us better and it makes the whole organization better. Number six, failing to take time for yourself and your family outside the business so you can have a life. If your entire life is your business, you're gonna lose your family. You're not going to have a family. You need to be able to spend time away from your business. And then when you're spending time in your business and even better, as Lynn was saying, on your business, you're more productive. It's not the quantity of time you spend, it's the quality of time that you spend. And it goes back to number four, which is failure, failing to see delegation as a critical element of successful leadership. If you have to do everything all by yourself, then you're never going to see your family. You're never going to see your friends. Your family and your friends are going to be your business. And if that's what you want out of your, out of your business, if that's what you want out of your life, that's not going to be a successful life. You need to have time away in order to be able to prioritize. And then when you're working, in your business, and even better, on your business. And what I mean by working on your business, taking that helicopter view. If you're working in your business, you basically become a firefighter. As I said before, if people are just bringing you their problems, they bring you their problems, and you have to solve them all, you're fighting fires all day long. What you need to do is give those problems back to the people that brought them to you in order to be able to make sure that they come up with potential solutions to the problem. It's easy to provide problems. It's much harder to provide solutions. Now, they may not have 
the entire solution because they don't see the company the way you do. But if they can see the ability to offer a solution, then you're not spending all of your time in your business. The last one, number seven, not having a succession plan or an exit strategy and not knowing the difference. Again, I'm going to end the way I started, which was with Michael Gerber in the e-myth. If you're the only one that's responsible for the success of your business, for revenue production in your business, you can't sell your business because the moment you leave your business, all the value has gone. There's nothing left. You need to put a succession plan together, not at the end when you're looking to leave, but at the beginning. You need to know how you're going to exit the business. Are you going to sell it? Are you going to give it away? Do you have any family members that want to take over the business? Or do you want to just close up shop and leave? There are different financial decisions that you need to make and different financial plans that you need to make when you determine what you want to do. And by the way, the value of your business is not necessarily what you think it's worth. The value of your business and the value of any product that you're selling is determined by what amount of money are people willing to pay for it? If you think your business is worth $5 million, but someone's only willing to pay three, then your business isn't worth $5 million. Right? And the way to, as Michael Gerber in the e-myth said, the way that you can ensure that your business retains its value is by making sure that there are processes and procedures in place so that the business could actually run without you being there. If you're required to be there in order to make sure that the business operates, then the second you walk out, it's worth nothing. So you need to make sure that you have a plan in place and that you put a process in pl place for your business to operate so that when you're not there, it can run as smoothly as if you are. By putting, by dealing with these seven critical mistakes and having a plan that resolves these seven critical mistakes, you have the ability along with the mindset and with the connections to make sure that your business thrives. Thank you for listening. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you, really appreciate it. So I'm going to, right now, I'm going to unmute uh, Lynn and make sure you get there. You may have to unmute yourself. And Rick, if you can unmute yourself, the three of you. So um, I know Carrie has to jump off, but she had a couple questions. She. Um, and thank you all because that was really that was great and I'm so proud to have all of you uh, be um, you know teaching all of us you know your wisdom so I really want to say thank you so I'm just going to ask some questions that came through if that's okay with the three of you um, and this these are for both happen to be from Kerry Flynn Barrett for Rick um, she wants to know, <laughs> Kerry wants to know Rick because you're a great connector do you ever disconnect um, thank you for the question, Kerry. Uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, one of the tidbits recently was about toxic people. And so, you know, um, it's totally fine to disconnect from toxic people. It's totally fine to disconnect when you're tired or you need to work. Um, it's fine to disconnect when you need more time for creativity. So um, it's not natural for me to disconnect, but it's definitely within my skill set now at this uh, ripe old age of 58. So um, it is definitely, um, you know, there are good times to disconnect. There are bad times to disconnect. As a matter of fact, I, I uh, 
I have some content that I wrote about disconnecting to connect better. So sometimes disconnecting from your phone or your computer with your work or a loved one will help you connect better. So, you know, we've got to drop the electronics sometimes. It's weird when we just leave our phone home and go out, we all feel naked, but um, yes, it is. It, I do disconnect and it is fine. Um, you know, if you need that, you know, to get rid of some negative or to bring on more positive. You're just kind of shifting energy, right? Yeah. Everything. Okay, great. Uh, I just want to mention, um, there's a whole bunch of uh, great stuff in the chat. If you guys want to, don't forget if you're leaving, if you want to save the chat, you just go down to the chat box. You click on the three dots and you can save the chat. So thank you. Another question from Carrie. So she wanted to know, um, is intellectual currency, Rick, the same as mental currency? Um, it, it can be close. I also uh, messaged her back saying that it could be similar to social and emotional currency too. But um, intellectual, intellectual currency, I think we, we probably think of that more as our own thoughts and uh, the ability to think um, in a higher level. So, you know, another good, another great insight. And, uh, you know, I think we could probably come up with a bunch more. Hopefully, now that you've all heard this, uh, you'll start to think about currency differently in your own lives. I would go as far as to say it's possible that the financial currency may be the least important currency in our lives. And it's one of the ones we pay the most attention to. Yeah, absolutely. But don't tell our financial advisors that, okay? Um, so I, so this one might be for a few of you. We can just go down. This is from Cameron Toth, and he's asking, how do I move from collecting employees to building a business building team? I don't know. Does anyone want to take that? And Cameron, it, do, do you think we need this coming on? Do we need some more information on that? Cameron, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it was uh, coming up when Lynn was talking, um, just in the idea of definitely thinking around my business. You know, I've done a great job of hiring employees that fill the service aspect of the business, but I've not done the, the best job over the years in terms of growing out my team so that I'm doing what I think is the most appropriate thing is, is hiring people that can replace you so you can move up and beyond. Move up and out and, you know, and, and definitely to what, uh, to what uh, Jim was uh, finishing up with in terms of, you know, that exit strategy. Cause now as I enter into that place of building multiple businesses, you want those businesses to operate independently and, and not have to worry about it as you move on to the next opportunity. Okay, so uh, Lynn, you want to take that first and then Jim? Sure. Um, so Cameron, in order to build that team, you have to first figure out exactly what that team is going to do. And you've got to, you've got to plan out how, who you need. What's, what, um, what, what things do they, those people need to do? And what things can you, do you want to take off of your plate? Really, eventually you want to get to the point where you are a strategist who comes in on a periodic basis, but not a daily basis, especially if you, I know it's in, since you're trying to build more than one business, that's what you need. You need to not be able to be there all the time. So eventually you have to, to take, uh, find people who will take every piece of what you do uh, and, and building out the team, you start with one. Seriously, if you find one piece and you get that person set and, and really doing that part and then you find someone to do the next piece of what you're doing and slowly build the team that way. Jim, you probably have some uh, thoughts too. Yeah, following up on that, um, basically you need to figure out what functions, and I'm not talking about the, the, the specific jobs. I'm talking in terms of what behaviors do, does the potential employee need to have to fill the position that you're looking for? So, for example, if you're looking to hire a business development person, what are the traits, the, the, the behavioral traits, the motivational type of traits that they need in order to be successful in that? You don't need someone who's necessarily been doing selling for a long time. You need to address 
the actual behaviors that a successful business development person would need to have. The other thing is, <clears throat> it, you're talking about you wanting to move on to other businesses. A president, a former president that we had used to say the expression trust but verify. Just because you wanna move on to another business, that doesn't mean that you can just take the business that's there, give it to someone else and say, you know what, I'm out of here. You have to be able to hold the people accountable for what their job is. You don't have to do all of the work, but you need to be able to know what's going on. And as an example of that, so if I, one of the, if I can go back for a second to that financial management piece that I was talking about, we tend to hire people to do the books and to do the financial end of our business. And then when one of those people screws it up and we find out that, you know what, they were stealing from me. What we end up doing is we get jaded and we don't want to hire anybody to do it. But that's the wrong approach. What we need to be able to do is hire someone who can do it better and faster, but then make sure that they're accountable to us. Okay, does that answer your question, Cameron? I'm sure you have. Yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely, um, the jaded part I, I, I connected with very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have, um, we don't, that was it for questions unless I didn't, unless I missed it. Did anybody come up with or want to, to ask, I mean, you've got a great panel here. Want to ask a question about your businesses? Just can you wave your hands? Um, does anybody want to make a comment? Um, anybody having any um, you know, issues or anything like that that they want to uh, bring to this group? Please um, unmute yourself and any, anyone? Okay, um, all right. So I guess you've, as I said, you've stunned them into silence. <laughs> uh, Maxine, Maxine's Maxine got a question. Raising her hand. Pardon? Maxine is waving her hand. Oh, good, Maxine. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Maxine Davis, and I am with Mary Kay, beauty consultant, um, skincare and cosmetic company. I am just getting ready. Thank you so much for inviting me, um, Tina, on this call. I have gained so much knowledge. Thank you for the great panel, Lynn, Rick, and... Um, Jim. Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So my question is, I am just getting ready to start um, jumping into Mary Kay and uh, it's taken me a bit to really get started. I am just, my thing is, um, how do I go about, you know, like getting my customers into this, you know, like buying Mary Kay and selling them. Into a funnel, right? Getting your customers yes. into a funnel. Um, and who wants to take that one? Join oh. Master Networks. <laughs> okay, Rick. <laughs> uh, so, so well, join, and then number two, what's that, Rick? <laughs> first thing I'll say, um, uh, Maxine, is congratulations. Thank on you. Deciding to take the entrepreneurial journey. It's a great life. Um, so you asked the question, how do I find customers? And this was all about mindset today. So the first thing I would say is if you can shift your focus away from customers to how do I find people and how do I find people to connect with? And just as we put this out for entrepreneurs so that they could get their businesses started and have the right mindset, all the information you heard here today is designed just for you. And if you start looking at people and connections as currency, that is gonna be a much better door to go through than to try to find customers because we all can be customers, but we're all people first. So if you connect with somebody, you have a far greater chance of learning more about them and serving them. And then they have a good chance of becoming a customer. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, any so I, w I was just going to add to that, very often people who are doing a multi-level kind of a business, 
don't think of it as a serious business. This is just something I'm doing on the side. And that kind of goes to what I was saying is you have to be all in. If you're not totally committed that I'm doing this, if you're the one that's sitting back saying, well, I'm going to give it a try. I'll see if it's going to work. It's not going to work for you. You've got to be totally committed. I'm doing this. And that's when, that's when you'll start to do the things you need to do. Rick is absolutely right. You know, the, the connections, but you won't do those connections and you won't come across positively about your business if you're not totally uh, all in yourself. So you've got to make that commitment to your business first. Thank you. you all, the other thing you need to do, Maxine, is you have to be able to really dig deep and figure out why should I do business with you as opposed to anybody else that does what you do. That should be an easy, easy answer. Like, don't overthink that. Like, you're awesome. You're incredible. You bring yeah. this amount of experience to it, right? This is not a hard question. No, definitely. Maxine, I have to say that you're so beautiful that, you know, people are going to want to use Mary Kay to be like you. <laughs> and I have so I have sold I'm sorry I have sold products like that someone is like Maxine can I just have everything you're wearing <laughs> my sister bought all the products I was wearing yeah, because you're in that business and I have seen people who are personal trainers that are way overweight or I've seen you know I've seen people that are really it's not congruent with what they're so I want to just uh, applaud you because you're Thank all you. well, you're you know you're 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 talking about it you're ready to go you're showing us so i want to say yeah. I, got the I got my <laughs> I'm, I'm proud um yeah, so we're in the face <laughs> we're in the face um so then we have i know amy you want to ask a question but gene terman came on first so then we'll go to amy thank you gene so to all three of you that was really amazing but i actually have a question for max and carol so you've you've been really influenced by rick as a connector how has that changed to your life because i know how it changes all of ours how, how has it affected you guys yes okay so for me um you know it really gives me a mindset to really go for <laughs> and at least focus you know and put all in uh, you know, everything that I've learned today, Maxine, do you really want this? How dedicated are you? How serious are you? You know, are you all in, you know, to do this? Yeah. So that is awesome, Maxine. Thank you. I'm actually going to throw it to Rick, to Carol as well, if that's okay. Carol and Max. Hi. Thanks, Jean. So Rick is a connector and it means a lot of talking. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There, there is a lot of talking. He loves people. He drums up conversations everywhere we go. And um, I think it's been a really great example for our two boys, Max and our older son, Alex. And, um, you know, in a time when uh, teenagers and young people, uh, not all of them, but some of them are not connecting as much. They're not, you know, using eye contact and shaking hands and things saying hello, things like looking up from their phones or taking their earbuds out. Um, I have an ex you know, two boys who really um, respect what we do in our home, which is um, you know, talk to people and greet people and you know, do things like that. So I'm really proud of what, they, what the example he's been for our kids. Yeah. Pretty much at home, it's like living with an, an encyclopedia with ADHD because <laughs> He just has a never ending stream of information and, you know, he's got a never ending stream of energy too. And he just never stops, never stops, but it's, it's amazing. And he's the best person I could have to learn from and, you know, get all my information from. So it's really great. That's awesome. Great question, Jean. Uh, it's really good to know that this whole master networks thing just doesn't affect your business. It affects your life. Yeah. Thank That's you. Right. That's right. It goes, it's all those layers deep. I'm sorry, Amy, uh, did you, can you unmute yourself? You wanted to ask a question. There you go. Hi, thank you so much. I, um, I enjoyed all the speakers and I thank Maxine and Jean for giving me the courage to ask my question. <laughs> um, 
so, so my business, I, <laughs> I've gotten to a point where, because I do, I'm guilty as charged with the doing everything myself. I have a handmade business and I'm making everything. And I, I see that there's a ceiling. There's definitely a ceiling um, because with my two hands, I can only make a certain amount of product in a certain you know, number of days and hours. And um, so, you know, I, I, in order to grow, I've either got to charge more for my product or find people to help me make more product, I think. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out how, how do I, how do I sort that out? How do I? Who wants to take it? Well, I'll start. So, <clears throat> Amy, I know you and I talked. We did have a face-to-face. -face. We started to actually broach that topic. And really, it comes down to, as Lynn said earlier, figuring out what is it that you want to do in the business and figuring out what is it that you can give away, you're willing to give away, and that you're willing to hire someone else to do. Now, it sounded to me like you really like designing the products. And since you like designing, you can probably hire people to make the products. And there are ways to help determine what type of behaviors, motivators, et cetera, that that type of person really would need to have. And I'm, again, I'm happy to follow up with you later on if that's of interest to you, but that's really where you need to start. So uh, Amy, you and I have had that conversation a couple times as well. And um, I, I think Jim is right that you do need to, um, you, you do love the, the design part. And honestly, taking that step to give a piece of, of actually creating it away is going to be hard for you because it's, it's, you put a lot of love into what you've been doing. But I think that you'll give, you'll take one easier piece and start there and let some other people make the easier pieces. And then once you feel comfortable that they're doing it and they're doing it right, then you can take the next step and the next step. So it's, it's a small step process. It's not a, okay, I'm just gonna do it and give it, give it all away. No, you're gonna find the easy part, something that's, that's simple and have them start there. And then you'll eventually train them to do the more and more complicated ones. You also have to figure out when is good, good enough. Okay, so um, is there anybody else? I'm just going trying to flip through this. If anybody wave your hand, so I could see. Oh, Jonah, go ahead, honey, unmute uh, yourself. Uh, this question is for Jim. Jim, um, when you talked about pricing your services, that really resonated with me um, because I had a brick and mortar office as a nutritionist. And um, since this whole pandemic happened, I actually closed my office doors and um, now I'm virtual. And it really um, put a spotlight on that I wasn't really making enough money. It was just enough to cover the rent. And, um, but now I'm evaluating my, my price points for my services. And I feel like there's that fear, like you said, that, oh, other people in my industry are charging certain rates and I'm afraid of charging more because I really feel that I'm worth more. But in comparison to them, you know, how do you, how do you determine that? How do you come to that number? Well, what you really need to do, is you started the process by figuring out that you were just barely breaking even and paying your rent. That's the first step. But the second step, is really figuring out what is it that you want to make out of your business and then being able to put out there why you are able and why you're worth that price. In essence, we end up trying to be as price competitive as we can. And quite often that puts us on the value rack. Get yourself off the value rack. If you think, if you feel and you can sell the fact that you don't deserve to be on the value rack, you can then charge more. And I'm happy to talk to you about it offline, but basically that's really what it's about. You have to believe that you're worth more and you have to be able to quantify the fact that you are really worth more. 
the other thing is that when you do this, you, when you go to raise your prices, you have to expect that you're, you're going to lose some people. Mm -hmm. And you have to be okay with that. Um, and you could lose several people and then pick up some other clients at the higher rate. And you don't have to have as many clients that way. So it's, you have to, you have to kind of do that calculation in your head too. I may not have to have as many clients to get, have the same income. I just need to have the right clients. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Stacy, did you have your hand up? Stacy Clark? I do. Hello. So uh, first of all, I'd like to just say welcome to everyone who are guests here today or not members of Master Networks. I love when someone, uh, when Maxine asked a question and someone said, join Master Networks. That's a part of the solution. And I certainly agree with that. Um, so I want to say welcome to them. And if it's okay, I'd like to just address Maxine. Um, I also used to be someone who was involved with Mary Kay and I love the company and the, and the products. I just wanted to share with you that um, one of the most important things that happens when you do something that anyone can use, or so you think, I used to hate in networking meetings when people would say, oh, I can help anyone with skin. Well, when you're talking to everyone, you're talking to no one. So I just wanted to encourage her because it's important to remember that, like everyone said about you, you're beautiful, you're unique, and someone asked you to think about what, in fact, are the things that make you unique and make you the best person to buy from. So I want you to always be mindful of that and don't put yourself out there to work with everyone or anyone because when you can identify who you are best able to serve and who you want to speak to and you get very clear in your focus and you talk directly to them they will hear you everyone else will fall away because they'll realize you're not the solution to their problems that'll make you more visible to those for whom you are so i just wanted to encourage you um, in that direction and again welcome to marry uh to, to master networks and congratulations on you looking into that opportunity with um mary Kay. Thank Very you good. so much. That was so helpful. Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much. Well, this is, you know, being part of this family. It's, um, we have, we love to give advice. <laughs> that's, definitely, that's definitely part of this group. And you know what, you just, sometimes you just need to hear that nugget at that moment. And you could have heard it from three other people, but you needed that one person to say it. Anybody else uh, raising their hands? I'm trying to go through the list, see if there's anybody else, um, or just unmute yourself and, um, oh, I'm sorry, Lisa, did you say, is, is it Lisa Ferry? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, I just was thinking about um, when Jonah was asking about, um, you know, the possibility of raising prices and being concerned that some people might be turned off, and, and um, I, it just reminded me, Julia Moore from J. Moore Insurance is in the Yorktown chapter, always says you have to be able to say no to the good in order to be able to say yes to the best. So even if you're going to alienate some people, others are going to be drawn to you and, and um, that's okay. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi. Uh, oh, okay, go ahead. I'm Adriana from Dance Love Ballroom Studio and uh, we have run our business for 10 years now. We thought we were having it very successful. We built it up from zero and we have returning customers to the studio, but uh, with the new times, everything changed for everyone. So my question will be how, uh, our students used to find us, okay? From word of mouth, uh, we were not very big in advertising uh, locally because dance studios, you have to be close to the dance studio in order to come to the dance studio. And um, my question will be, uh, would you recommend specific groups or a way to find the new customers, the online customers? Again, our business was word of mouth. I used to go at school, communicate with the moms a lot. And uh, I had that com conversation going on. Everything now is online. So, so does anyone want to take that? I mean, we, um, you know, I, I guess, um, so Adrian, are you looking for ideas? For I'm looking for ideas. How, like um, Maxine uh, had a question how to find customers. It's her new business. Before I knew how to find my customers. At school and um, we, 
we were seven years in a, lot, in a row best of the not. So through the not, we were finding a lot of wedding couples, but now weddings are on hold. So that field, we can't do anything about it right now. We're just waiting till. I, you know, sorry to interrupt you, but I see Cameron who, he also, his business was extremely affected. So Cameron, go ahead if you want to say something. Well, so one of the things that you can do is build your, your community. If the communities have been taken away from you, right? So you don't have that school of people, but you probably have some of those connections. Create something that is meaningful for your community. So when I think of like a dance studio, you probably have yourself talent that you can put on display. Uh, you can put together a weekly meeting. Tina just was on as a speaker for uh, MPI, Meeting Professional International's Westfield Chapter Lunch Bunch with me. So we've created, uh, our, I'm part of creating a community because we had to move online because we couldn't do in-person uh, live events. So we've created a space for people to come together, but there's no reason that any independent person that, you know, Maxine, I mean, people have been using this business strategy for years in terms of like a Tupperware party, right? So you get people together, try out the product and have conversations around it. The only difference now is we got to do it online or you can do a mix, right? Maybe you get a couple of the dancers that are comfortable coming into the studio, do a little dance. You got entertainment added, you got conversation. You can talk about uh, different things. You can create that community channel. What are your folks that you, I, are your ideal customers? What are they interested with? You know, what are your, uh, the people that would potentially want to perform or do something on, what are they interested in? Get if you can combine those two things, you got a, a edutainment kind of vehicle that you can bring people together and advertise your product and create those connections. Okay, you know what, we have to, we have one more minute. Does anybody want to, Lynn, Rick, or uh, Jim, did you have anything? I would just like to, uh, to, to, number one, thank Tina for, for sponsoring this whole thing. Thank you to Rick uh, for his great job. Uh, and Lynn, I know you took time out from your vacation to do this. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I thought it was great. Thank you. Listen, uh, I got frozen, so my, my keyboard is frozen. So luckily this whole thing didn't, uh, didn't end. But I would love for somebody to put off. Oh, my website in the chat. It's masternetworksny.com. All the things, anybody that needs to know information about Master Networks. And I want to thank Maggie Carey, who just did the website over. It's fantastic. Masternetworksny.com. Give you all the information about us and what we're doing. So I just want to thank you. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. If anybody would like to stay and continue to talk, it's fine. I just want to say thank you. Really appreciate everybody for coming. We're going to be doing this quarterly. Uh, Master Networks is an amazing group of people. It's learning-based. It's community-minded. Please think about coming and joining with us because it's just an amazing group. So thank you so much. Lynn, Rick, Jim, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. You guys have been fabulous. Thank you for having me. Thank you.